Cool. So first question. Thank you, Lauren, for being brave. What topic would you focus on revising in the next few days if you had to choose two or three? <laughs> so um, I actually wrote down a few. So the first one always that they test you on is subconsultants. I'm pretty sure that's consistent. Like, Sela, what do you think? Yes, definitely subconsultants. Um, they always have like one, they had one or two questions on both of the exams that I remember. Yeah, definitely, definitely read up on that. Yes, because yes. that's pretty tricky. The second one is a broad one, but it touches on everything is liability and duty of care. So differences between con contractual liability um, and what is negligence and what your duty of care is as an architect. I think it, most questions relate to that, but that is definitely a topic, topic you should revise. And the last one, I mean, I'm also gonna say you try to revise everything because you don't know what they're gonna throw at you. Um, the other one is um, obviously contract administration, specifically, uh, what is it? Um, practical completion. So I remember there were a myriad of ways they would ask about practi um, practical completion, not just what do you do at practical completion? That's more an interview question. But I think the question I remembered was like, you know, here's a list of things that haven't been done. Has this project reached practical completion? And then I think they gave you like the the, the doorway wasn't sealed or, you know, the light fixing wasn't um, installed. So the thing they're testing you on is, is this, can you deem this as practical completion, i.e. is this habitable and can be safely occupied while they complete the rest of the work? So it's not just knowing what to do at practical completion, it is also knowing what, or making a judgment as to what practical completion is. Um, Stella, do you have any other topics you think is important? Um, uh, I was thinking the back of my head, liability, that's a huge one. Cause I think at least, I think all the questions on my exam had something about liability thrown in there. Um, whether or not it was just part of the scenario or, um, yeah, or one of the questions. Yeah, though, that liability one really got to me um, just because of the way that they word it. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely something to um, reread about. Hi, Papa. Mm. So um, I hope that's answered your question. I will touch on those topics at the end if you want to stick around. Um, but let's move on to Barbara's, Barbara's question, which is please explain changes in cash retention during CA and how to manage this. Can I get a bit more of an elaboration on that question, Barbara, if you want to un unmute yourself? Hi, everyone. <laughs> I, I see you there. <laughs> um, I just, it was just a question. Uh, I was going through the major works contract with Ella last night, and we were just trying to think of questions. Um, and so in the major works, you can change cash retention and bank warranty or not bank warranty, just cash retention. Um, would that be a question, do you think? Or, um, and if so, I don't know, do you want to? Would you, uh, I don't have a question really, just a little bit elaborate about the topic. Okay, so let, let's talk about cash retention generally as a topic. So cash retention can be in um, either two forms. So um, it could be cash retention, sorry, the proper term is security. Um, security can be held in two different forms, cash retention or a bank guarantee. So you can do that in simple works. The difference in major works um, is that the contractor can also ask the owner for um, security for any pre-ordered items, plant equipment that they have on site. So that's the main difference. I think how it's changed is usually dictated by the contract. Um, when it can be changed, I don't, I don't remember if it can be changed, but I think I'm sure it can. It really is not up to you to decide how it's changed. It's the contract. It's for you to 
execute. So your role as a contract administration is not to dictate how things happen. That's the contract. You're there to make sure it happens properly. Uh -huh. um, in terms of the exam, I don't remember anything that specific about the AB contract. I, I think they've made it pretty clear that never in the exam will they ask you to recite a clause from the AB contract. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, they definitely don't um, touch up on contracts in the exams. Um, it's more to do with the result. Like, so definitely that's why I keep saying liability because a lot of the questions, um, they want to know whether or not you understand um, if in a particular scenario, um, what, who, who who would be um, most responsible for something to go wrong? Um, they might touch up on say you're using a major works contract or something, um, but I think as long as you understand what's what's in in the contract, you don't really need to know the nitty gritty details about about um, like each clause of it. Um, yeah, it's more to do with the liability and who would be at fault. I got so many questions in my in the exam that um, the the last exam I was at um, with about liability. Who's at fault in in particular scenarios? So mm -hmm. definitely definitely read up on that um, and the wording in those questions about liability is is what can get you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Um, yeah, just just be careful of that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, just to go into that a little bit further, I'd, I'd like to explain concepts as opposed to what you need to remember so you can apply it. Your role as a contract administrator, administrator, it's in the word administrator, is to administrate the contract. You are not a lawyer. You are not an insurance provider. You are not a judge. As much as we are requested to understand um, the concept of liability and where it generally lies, the ultimate decision lies with the court or whoever rules on this. So you might think, you might say, okay, in the contract it says the owner is more liable. It might get to court and say, okay, the contractor is actually liable. You don't know. So what do you actually need to know? What you need to know is your responsibility as a contract administrator. So have you done your job properly, which is have you sent out the proper notices? Have you, um, you know, executed the contract as per the wording? Um, have you used your best judgment as an architect to make an evaluation? Regardless of whether it, it is right or wrong at the end of the day, your, your responsibility is to make your best judgment. That might get peer reviewed, whatever. What the exam is really testing you on is your ability to make a, a reasonable judgment. That's what it's ultimately testing you on. So all you can do is read the question carefully, think about the key concepts and components and um, types of clauses, not the specifics, like you know, what is your responsibility as a contract administrator and pick the best answer based on your judgment. Because that's what you were going to do in reality. Like no one is there to tell you whether it's right or wrong. You use your best judgment. Does that does that make sense? Or did I just confuse you more? No, that, that makes sense. And just to, to push in because there's a lot of questions. So in regards to liability, what we're kind of what I've kind of absorbed is the architect is basically liable for everything, really. Like mm, no. In terms of duty of care and like responsibility. Um, as long as insurances are in place, you just have to be careful about everything. Mm. Yeah. Short answer is no. Um, that is a big topic. I have parked out some time at the end to talk about liability in general and what the architect is liable and not liable for. I'm, I might park that for later if that's all right, Baba. I'll move on to the next questions. So. We kind of touched on Lauren's question next, which is what level of detail do I need to know regarding the different types of contracts? So I remember questions where it says, in this scenario, what's the best form of contract? 
uh, what, you know, if we're using a um, AVIC contract, you know, what, what, how does that affect this scenario? Depends on the scenario, obviously. Like if, you know, if this, they might give you a scenario, this is how the exam works. They give you a, a scenario and then in the question, there's a bit more information. So they might say, this thing happened. If this project was under an AVIC contract, what is the implication? That's that's it. Like you don't need to know exactly what's the exact clause, but the general components of what's in each type of contract. Yes, you do need to understand the um, allocation of liability in each um, type of contract. Yes, you have to understand. Um, what else? Your role as an architect, not always as a contract administrator, as an architect in under each type of contract, you have to know. So the best example I I can give you is like. You know, if it said um, under the AB contract um, and you're the contract administrator, what should you tell the contractor? And versus if it was under a DNC contract and you're working for the builder, what do you say to the builder? Versus if it was a um, Australian standard contract and you are the client's consultant, client advisor, what do you say to the contract contractor? If you did your studies right, you'd know those are three different answers. But none of it has to do with what is actually in the contract. Does that make sense, Lauren? Yeah. Stella, do you have anything to add? Knowing what the what do you need to know about different types of contracts? Um, not, I think, I think you've summarized it well. Um, yeah, I th yeah, kind of add to that. I think just know the general basics of um, yeah, each contract, especially who is liable. I always come back to liability just because all the questions have at least each scenario, um, depending, it doesn't matter um, what kind of scenario it is, there is always one question about liability, at least one question. So, yeah, when you're reading about contracts, know the general differences between them, as Eddie had said, and the liability, who would be liable in each contract as well. Yeah. Um, next question from Barbara. Um, what sort of NCC question should we focus on? Okay, so this is... It's hard to answer because the NCC is so broad. They could literally yes. ask you anything. Yeah. The question I came across, and you know, Stella, please talk about yours. Um, yeah. Was, I was asked one about, um, you know, what class of building is this, and I was like, I don't remember. Um, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, I think there was one about waterproofing, and who's liable, or like. And then there was one about, I think it was accessibility. Like if the lift is here, like is that in breach of NCC or something? Maybe it wasn't in breach of NCC, it was related to something else. Um, I think that one was about the class. Um, yeah, the wheelchair one, I remember that one, the lift. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that was more to do with uh, what class of building is it and um, what's the standard or something like that or general mm. standard or something. Yeah. Um, oh yes, the yeah. The other, yeah. The other yeah. question yeah. I got asked um, was about the mezzanine level. So uh, I think it was something about um, it was a commercial building, and um, the client wanted to add a mezz mezzanine level to it. And the question was something like, uh, "Is that included within the building envelope or not?" Um, and what class or something the mezzanine was, um, what what is the class the mezzanine is classified as or something. So, yeah, the NCC questions are just, yeah, they're just really random. Like, you just mm -hmm. don't know what they're going to ask you. Yeah. yeah. It's really based on, it's a test of your practical experience. Like, if you've actually worked even as a graduate long enough, you should be able yeah. to answer these things. Like, it's more to do with like, which standard, you know, can you find, like, what what are the, which part of the NCC is related to accessibility? So part A, B, C, or D. Like, yeah. work long enough, you have a vague 
recollection of what it is. Um, there is no specific, like, what, you know, what is this in breach of, you know, which clause? None of that. Like, that's not for us to remember. That's, um, yeah, it's not going to be tested in the exam. It's more like, you know, do you have the general knowledge expected of an architect to give advice? Um, next question, which from Brenda, which topics on subconsultants would it be focused on? Whose responsibility would it be and who is liable? Um, okay, so when dealing with subconsultants, broad level, you are always liable. <laughs> if they are your subconsultants, you are always liable. What the topics deal with is how you mitigate your risk and liability um, as an architect. So the question I remember was like, oh my God, I, I hated this question because it was worded so terribly. It's like, here's a scenario, I think the structural engineer, no, the roof collapsed. The sub structural engineer is your, your sub-consultant. And there was like, you know, the builder um, and something. And then the question was like, in the first instance, <laughs> <laughs> yes, the first instance, the wording, yeah, yeah that yeah. was horrible. I think it's still to, to this day, I don't know what that question was trying to ask, but <laughs> wording is important, that's all I'm going to say. So it's to work out who is going to get sued first, and then how do you then deal with that after you've been sued? So, you know, if you've been studying, you understand things like, you know, limitations of liability, you know, how important it is to have back-to-back -back contracts, back-to-back -back insurances. You know, if you engage a structural engineer, make sure it's, um, you need to have, uh, in, they need to have PI insurance that is at or above your insurance. They can't limit their liability uh, more than you've limited yours to the client. So it's just, understanding these concepts and understanding the risks of engaging some consultants uh, any uh, anything else again i will go into sub consultants in more detail at the end um cool so next one uh, have i answered that question brenda just send a thumbs up if i have awesome um nicholas so Exam basic confirmations, pass mark, duration of exam 75 minutes. Um, so again, I I took it as 75 minutes. Stella, was yours 75 minutes? Um, so the second time I did it, it was uh, um, online. Oh, was it? Yeah, it was an online exam yeah. um, because of COVID and everything. So from memory, I think it was 75 I think mm. they didn't change it if it was online. I'm not sure now. Yeah. Are you guys doing it online or um, in person? I think it's all online now. Is it? OK. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's still 75 minutes. Yeah. It's still 75 minutes. Um, yeah. I know next year they're changing it to, I think it's 120 minutes. Oh, yeah. wow. wow. Longer exam. But that, that, as far as I know, is happening in 2024. They're making all those changes in 2024. So for now, just check the website, it should tell you, but for now it's 75 minutes. Oh, wait, um, they're saying it's 90 minutes. Oh, 90 minutes, there you go. Yeah. I don't work for WACA, I <laughs> just read the website. <laughs> Barbara, did you have a question? I saw your mouth moving. 90 minutes. 90 minutes. 90 yeah. minutes, okay. Pass mark, okay, this is weirdo. Pass mark, there is no pass mark. Um, so basically what they do is you do the exam, everyone, they look at everyone's answers and then they might eliminate certain questions. So they might say, this question was worded poorly, everyone did badly, you know, this question didn't make sense, we're going to remove that. So they'll do a round of like culling of questions. So those answers are not, um, are not, uh, included in the calculation. And then they just do like a, you know, the bell curve redistribution, whatever, and then decide this is the mark. So the, I don't think they tell you, but we, I ask around because I am nosy and I was like, oh, what marks did you get? Well, I, get? I think in my year it was about 70%. Oh no, there was a, that year. <laughs> Sorry, Stella, what did you get? I'm not going to say it, but you know. 
So I think that you, I, I was like two marks off. If they had kept that one question, I don't know. I might have passed. I might not have. But I was two marks off of passing that year. And then um, the next year, yeah, I, I was, yeah, I did well. But the first year, like when I did it with you, Eddie, mm. I think, yeah, it was two marks. And one of the questions that were included, that was a, like a suspicious question. Um, I think I got that right. Um, but yeah, I was just two marks off. So that was really, it was really frustrating for me. So mm -hmm. yeah, I just redid it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, yeah. Look, there is a pass, there is a cutoff. I, I would say it's around 70%, some years 75, some years 65, but it's around. I think, I think our year, it was, uh, 65. 65. Yeah, it was 65. Cause I, I think I got like 63 or something and then, yeah. So that was a bit annoying. <laughs> yeah. So going into the exam, don't be a perfectionist. You don't need to get 100%. <laughs> Even 90. Take some risks. Um, next question um, from Sneha. Sneha, sorry if I pronounced that wrong. How would you choose contracts from the Australian standard form of contracts depending on the type, scope of works? When you say Australian standard form, are you talking about the standard form of contracts or the Australian standard contracts? Could I just get some clarification? Hello? Sneha? Sneha? Okay, I might talk about both then, <laughs> just to save time. So um, if we're talking about, you know, how do you choose from all of the contracts, um, you don't get to choose the you get to make a recommendation the client chooses and usually that's chosen together with um the assistance of a lawyer so basically if it's a mum and dad they'll go to you and say hey you know which one do you prefer to you or like which one would you recommend or they might not even know how to ask that question they'll be like what do we do when like we you know, hire a builder and they'll be like, oh, and you'll be like, well, don't sign their contract, <laughs> first off. Um, you know, I would recommend using the ABIC contract with me as a contract administrator and then going to like explaining what that even means. They might just say, yep, I trust you, you go, you know, organize that, or they'll go and find a lawyer who will say, yes, use the ABIC or no, use Australian standard or no, use my standard contract and pay me a gazillion dollars for it. Who knows? But you don't get to choose. Um, you will be tested on um, making a judgment on what's the most appropriate contract to use and contract type, not specific. So I think I had a question where the client is a, I think it was like hardware store or something. They wanted to do a giant rollout of, a, you know, a hundred warehouses. They're all mod like they're all repeatable with all the same thing, different sizes, same elements. Like which contract do you use? And then you make a recommendation. So that's the extent of knowing what you choose. Do you remember anything else related to that, Stella? No, I don't. Um, I don't recall any question in the sec second time round either. Mm. Um, yeah, sorry, I can't help with that one. You're good. Yeah, so no, usually they don't ask you to choose a contract. They'll just tell you what contract it is. Most of the time it's ABIC. Um, they'll just be like, you know, um, the, the contract has been engaged under a ABIC simple works contract. They'll say it in the scenario, or they'll say, you know, it's under a DNC contract or whatever it is. You, most of the time they'll just tell you. Australian standards contracts, are generally not tested because it doesn't involve the architect. Um, it's usually between a project manager, the builder, and the client. If the architect gets involved, so you ask, you're asked to be the superintendent or something. I've asked like a very, I think one of my advisors in PALS talked about this. Um, if anyone ever asks you to be a superintendent as for an Australian standard contract runaway, <laughs> Um, or get someone who knows what they're doing because it's very complicated. So I hope that answers your question. Um, 
What do you, what percentage of the exam are we expected to achieve? And are there any topics that carry a higher percentage than others? So we talked about the passing percentage and how that works. There are, they're all marked equally. It's all one mark, no negative marking. You know, you get it right, you get one point, you get it wrong, you get no points. That's all it is. Um, to pick the easy ones to answer first, because they all count the same. Um, it's still nine questions. Nine questions, sorry, nine scenarios, five questions each. It's all the same. When they are, Ella, Ella, so when they are asking about liability in the exam, is the answer usually that the architect is liable or do they also give options where we wouldn't be liable? Uh, when it comes to liability, it's not always pointing the finger at the architect. It almost always is about who is actually liable. So question again i remember is um you know the one i talked about where the roof fell, fell through there's a project manager there's a structural engineer there's the architect who is liable make your choice and it's not always the architect um other times it's like you know uh you you may have you know, um, given an instruction and something went wrong, who is liable? Might not be an architect. You might have done the right thing. Somebody else screwed up. Sometimes, yes, it is like, you know, you forgot to do something or there, um, you know, you decided to, um, you decided to write, design something on a napkin and um, they took it, built it, someone broke a leg, are you liable? Short answer is yes, depending on the scenario. So there are both sides. It's not about just, they're not trying to say architects are always liable because otherwise no one would become an architect. It's, <laughs> it's more to say, if you encounter that scenario, you need to know how to protect yourself. You need to know how to accurately say, hey, I'm sorry, I don't think in this scenario I am liable. I think we should investigate this in a professional way because you might sit there and say oh no no i'm so sorry like i shouldn't have done that don't ever say that because immediately you have admitted liability when maybe you don't uh anyway i'm getting ptsd but from work um so i hope that answers your question ella euphemia that is an awesome name stealing it um how architects liable in DNC contracts? Okay, so <laughs> DNC contracts are interesting. They generally don't test architects' liability in DNC contracts. It's more about the builder's liability. Uh, sorry, maybe I'm wrong. Architects can be liable under DNC contracts, but you have one layer of protection, which is the builder. So depending if you're working, if you're working with the, the client as a client advisor and you're not under the builder, then it's a different scenario. But most of the time they're saying you're, you're, you've been, um, what's the word, novated to the builder. You've done something, the builder's ignored it. Um, you know, the roof fell down. Um, are you liable? That's the kind of questions I'll ask you. So you have given direct advice to the contractor however you are working under them they have a right to to ignore you um because they are technically your employer who is liable depends if you had it in writing <laughs> yeah it's just proving the point but really no if you did give a clear instruction to the builder they decided to ignore it it comes back to the, the company or whoever made the decision. Um, so I guess the the main difference between like working under a builder and a DNC contract and working for the client under an ABIC contract is your level of authority. So if you're a contract administrator, you can send an architect's instruction. The client, sorry, the contractor cannot ignore it, otherwise it's a breach of contract. If you're under, working under the builder under a DNC contract, they can ignore it all they like. It's not a legal thing. It is a, if they, if something goes wrong, so if they, 
if you give them advice and they do something completely different, but nothing goes wrong, it's fine. But if you give them advice, they ignore it and something goes wrong, then it's not, then they have issues. What I will also say is if that ever happens, regardless of who is at fault, call your insurer. <laughs> I think that's the first thing you do, call your insurer. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. So, Tim, in the practice exam, there was a scenario involving engagement of cost estimator. The correct answer being to tell the client to engage a cost estimator or walk away from the project. My answer was to ask for written indemnification, so essentially two correct answers. Uh, many questions phrased this way with more being the more correct answer. Yes. <laughs> yes. It, wording, okay, I, I hate this, but this is the reality of things. They don't trip you up with knowledge, they trip you up with, with wording. And I've heard many, many people who take the exam who are like, English is, is their second language and they don't struggle with the knowledge, they struggle with the questions. Um, your, your job is to pick the most correct answer. And there may be two answers that are similar or similarly correct, what you're looking for is the textbook answer. So I, I I think I told someone this yesterday, where I was like, do not think of yourself as an architect, think of yourself as a lawyer. As a lawyer, what is the thing that you need to do to minimize your own risk? So if, so I guess your example is like, um, if you haven't, scenario involving engagement of a cost estimator is the correct answer to tell the client to engage a cost estimator or walk away from this project or is it to have written indemnic indemnification so essentially two correct answers my opinion also i do this at work which is a different situation my um my um i guess my interpretation of the sequence of events is Private client asks you to um, do a cost estimation. You say no, tell them to get a cost estimator. They say no, you need to get one. You go and engage one as a sub consultant. And then if you can get indemnification, if you can't, if you, I would say just don't ever do a cost estimation by yourself with or without indemnification. Um, a good a good um, reference point is that um, was it the architects architectures architect services cost estimation is not one of our services mm -hmm. so it's definitely something you don't tell your client you can do mm -hmm. um, it's yeah um, it's also it's also in the um, ARB contract as well standard contract. They put a clause in there saying that we're not cost estimators. We can give a rough, a rough um, cost. However, we are always obliged to advise the client to engage a cost estimator. Um, yeah. So it's definitely not something that we should be doing ourselves. Mm. Yeah. Um, and also walking away from a project unless it's unless they're asking you to do something illegal or it's in breach of the code of conduct is generally the wrong answer because your job if you are engaged to the client your duty of care is to make sure the project gets built in the safest way possible so if you flip the table it's technically you're not a, you're not acting in a professional manner Although we all we've all been there, it's, you know, we all want to do that. Sometimes I wanted to do that last week. Anyway, <laughs> um, so ninety minutes, ninety minutes. Thank you so much. Um, again, you can check the double CA website. It will have an explanation of the formatting, online timing, number of scenarios, number of questions. It's all on there. Australian standard contracts. I touched on that earlier. Um, so if we need clarification, I can talk about building contracts as a specific topic um, at the end. Do we want to talk about building contracts as a specific topic at the end? Please send a thumbs up. Yeah. 
Okay, so I'll add it. I'll add it to my list. Mm -hmm. Um, so Dean, hey Dean. Um, all right. <laughs> so question Apex Info Works 2018 H progress claims scenario. If the architect does not inspect the works and assess whether the stage has reached stage completion and fails to issue the certificate within 10 days, is the contractor entitled to the full amount after the 10 days or after the contractor's notice after five days? If this okay, so I'll Okay, I'll answer that one first and then we'll go into the next one. So, first off, you will never be asked to recite word by word what is in the clause. So, no one's ever going to be asked, uh, going to ask you, oh, you didn't inspect what happens next. You didn't, you know, the contractor didn't issue the um, follow up email, what happens next? Like, how many days do you have? Wait, hold on. Have, have you an encountered any questions where it's like, how many days do you have to? Two issues, um, I think. No, um, mm. generally it would say in the scenario. Mm. Um, I think for the questions, I think um, the easiest rule of thumb, just think of it like an exam. Um, in Think of it, there are five, I think it's four or five answers. Two of them will be a ridiculous ones, where it's like definitely not the correct answer. There may be two that are very similar um, where you just have to really be careful of how they word things. Um, yes, think like a lawyer, think about um, the, the liability and really think carefully of how they're wording the answer because that's, yeah, I th that's what you should be having in your mind um, when you go into the exam. Think of it as there's going to be two very similar correct answers and two answers that just don't um, fit the fit the question or fit the scenario. So it, it really just comes down to two answers in the end, and mm. that's where it can stump you yeah, with the wording. So just be mindful of that in terms of actually um, looking at the the clause of a contract and things like that. They I, I haven't come across it when I did my two exams. Um, they generally put it in the scenario for you. So um, yeah, just read the scenario well um, and just read the wording of the scenario as well. Yeah. Mm. So again, I will answer that question. So the, the question relates to process of approving um, a payment claim. So I think under the pay, um, under the ADIC contract, I'm literally like diving into my deep seated knowledge. Yes, you have 10 days to inspect the works and then you have um, to issue a judgment. So I think, yes, if you do not, if you do not inspect and issue a, a um, payment certificate, the contractor is entitled to the claim. But in saying that, read the contract read exactly what the contract says. Not for the exam, but if you ever get into that scenario, they always say you do contract administration with a copy of the contract sitting right next to you. So you flip to that page, you read exactly what it says. AB contract is designed to be easily understandable in plain English. So just read it, it will say, okay, 10 days, within 10 days, architect must issue certificate, or um, if the architect fails to issue certificate, the contractor must do this. And then if they don't do that, then they have a pro um, they have a claim or it might go straight to the claim. But whatever it is, it is in the contract. The thing you should also study is not the ex exact wording, but the process. So I think there are flow charts in the user guides that show you, you know, in a progress claim, this is what happens. So um, contractor um, issues a progress claim, architect must inspect within 10 days. They must then issue a payment certificate or ask contract issue instruction for um, architect to, you know, re revise claim or remediate works, whatever it is. Understand the flow of events, not the number of days. That is, it's inconsequential in the sense that you can just read the contract. 
But what you need to know is what is the what is the sequence of events that should happen? Compare it to the scenario to see if it did happen. And if it didn't happen, that's usually what the exam question is about. So it's testing your understanding of the process and whether you can you can um, identify when things have gone wrong. Same same with like you know just architectural work in general. It's like you're supposed to do concept design before you do detail design, before you do this, before you do that. You should know intuitively when things are not the way it should be. Scenario two, if the architect inspects a work but doesn't issue the certificate within 10 days, is the contractor entitled to the full amount or only after the five day notice? Again, read contract. <laughs> we can go into it, or you can read it together, but if it's all in the contract and you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be tested on that, I'm sure. Okay, so last question and feel free to add more or we can, where are we up to? We're on, oh. We've gone for an hour already. Sorry, it was not looking at the time. Okay, last question. We'll take a quick break. Um, why are architects liable when project is tendered and it goes over budget, as cost estimation is not a part of architectural services? Great question. This duty of care, it only applies to mums and dads. So. How do I explain it? It's based on what, who has the knowledge and who has the responsibility to make sure things don't go wrong. So this doesn't apply when you are doing, like when you're working with a developer, because again, not legal advice, not legal advice, but when you get to court, they'll be like, okay, you developer, how many projects have you done? How come you didn't know to engage a cost estimator? You should have known. Or, hey, um, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, this is your first home. Have you ever done anything like this before? Why did you engage, um, you know, Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Miss Architect over here? Oh, because you thought they would guide you through the process. That makes sense. Did they tell you to get a cost estimator? No, they didn't. Okay, architect, why didn't you? Do you see how that works? So instead of just understanding our architect's liable, think about what happens in court. Like the judge is using common sense, not most of the time it's common sense, um, to work through who is actually responsible. So when you think like that, you think like a judge, you think like a lawyer, everything makes a bit more sense. So the short answer is yes, architects are liable to keep within the budget, not the one, not necessarily the one to do the cost estimation and find out how much it costs, but once they they should know to advise the client to do cost estimation incrementally through the design. And they are also responsible for adjusting the design um, so that it, it falls within the client's budget with adequate contingency. So obviously if you have a million dollar budget, you don't design to, you don't design to the point where you get a cost estimation, which is a million dollars without contingency. You design with the contingency, you get to, you know, I don't know, eight hundred thousand, or it's, you know, eight hundred and fifty thousand. So that whole thing about if you're a dollar over the tender, you're liable. Yes, but you don't get to the tender and then find out that it's blowing the budget. There's things that you should do before the tender to make sure you don't go over the tender. All within reason. Like, we all know we live in a crazy time right now. Prices are changing day by day. You know, if you get, if you do all the right steps, you do all the cost estimation, you have a QS, they've given you a number, you kept under the number, you have an adequate contingency, you get to tender and like, you know, um, the wildfire started again, and we've lost all the timber. So now timber prices have tripled. Is it your fault? No. <laughs> So it's all within reason and all within an assessment of like, have you tried to do the right thing? Okay, um, I might park that. Let's take a 15 minute break. We'll take a couple more questions and then we'll talk about um, quickly about experiences and then specific topics. Yeah, so 15 minutes. Um, just leave your 
screen, turn off your camera, um, I will make a shout when 15 minutes is up. And yeah, just turn it back on.
All right, everyone. Um, hope you had a nice break. Once you're ready, please come back. Um, turn your cameras back on if you would like, or send me a thumbs up just to let me know that you're ready. Five, six. Got six thumbs so far. Seven, eight. Nine, ten. All right, I think that's a couple more seconds. We'll dive back, back right in. Sound check, everyone hears me fine, sees me fine. All good? Yep. Cool. So, um, Got a couple of question, more questions in the chat that I'll um, go through. But before we do that, thank you, Jiang, for sending through that explainer. Um, the pass mark is 60%. Um, it, there's no adjustment applied to the results except in cases um, where the performance reflects that the scenarios and statements are misinterpreted. Um, and no adjustments are applied to the results. So things change all the time with the exam. Um, what happened with us may not be what's, um, how um, it will be assessed now, because <laughs> I know that people complain a lot <laughs> um, about the exam. So they're always trying to improve. I think when we took it, there was you no know, public pass mark. They've changed it. You know, I'm pretty sure that's just based on complaints. Again, 2024 is the year that they will change everything again. So in a big way, so, you know, you should be glad to be doing it now and just get it done before they change it, flip it upside down again. Um, Dean, so Dean's question, um, this question is in regards to the number of days to assess a claim is in the practice questions you provide. So um, if you know, um, I have a practice of architecture course on the Architecture 101 website. There's also a separate practice exam. So. I created that practice exam as a way to help people to get an understanding of the format, practice your timing. It's, you know, it's not a long time. Like, it, yes, it's 90 minutes now, but still not a, a lot of time. You get 10 minutes to go through nine scenarios. So you get 10 minutes of scenarios. So like you get two minutes per question. The, the, the um, motivation is to practice timing, reading, pacing, just so you're familiar with it. The way I've written the questions, yes, it's partly based on the questions I think you will be tested on. It's also a way to test your knowledge, specifically about areas that I know people struggle with or um, may mis misinterpret. So although I, I said you won't be tested on um, you know, specific days or claims and all that stuff, if you do get that question wrong, I hope that's like a, um it's just a trigger for you to revive that topic so that that's the intention behind the exam it's not a reflection at all to the actual exam questions and i i'm i know it can be taken that way sometimes when people want to know exactly what they're going to be tested on i don't work for double aca i'm not involved in the actual exam process i hope to be an interviewer one day i'm a couple of years off um but yeah, that's that's the intention behind the exam, uh, practice exam questions. Um, cool. So we'll get. Oh, so where do you do the practice exam? So I think there's one on the Double ACA website. I haven't looked at it recently. I've also got one on my website. So do both. Use whatever you want. Use all the resources in, available to you. I just want to create more resources to help people. You know. And so they have the best chance of passing it on the first go. That's all it is. Okay, so Nicholas, Nicholas's question, a uh, reasonably competent architect would likely design a building within a budget. Yes, yes. Is that the question, Nicholas? Do you want to explain or? Yeah, yeah. I was just um, sort of writing to see if the, I was correct in what I was thinking towards um, the question above where we're talking about where why are architects liable when a project is um it goes over budget so i was just saying is that kind of the the way we think about it that answer if that makes sense 
Yes, yes. So reasonably competent architect is the test, but there is also in the New South Wales Code of Practice, there's a specific clause relating to cost. So it is part of Code of Practice to design within the means of your client. That is part of the Code of Practice. So yes, as a reasonably competent architect, you should be able to design within a building, uh, sorry, within a budget, but also it is your responsibility under the code, which is a legal instrument. Sweet. So when what that means is it is both a uh, statutory liability and a tort liability. So it's two things. Um, and again, yes you are expected to you are expected to design within a budget you are not expected to know how much a building costs to build at any one time so uh I don't know, where are we up to what d is interested stella to know more about the mezzanine question and if you remember the answer um so i if i remember correctly it was to do with the area of the mezzanine level um so if it's a mezzanine level cannot be was it more than 200 meters squared um if it's more than that it's not considered a mezzanine level so i i don't remember the question per se but it had to do with the area and i think the area was like 250 or something um so it's not actually considered a mezzanine level i think um that's that was one of the one of the questions um to do with the area and um if it was a i think it had to do with um yeah what class of building it is as well um i don't remember exactly what the question was but i do remember um whether or not if i don't remember if it was exactly about the class of mezzanine or the overall class of the building so i just yeah the mezzanine one it was to do with the square area so if it's if it's less than 200 if it's less than 200 it's considered but if it's more than that um it's not considered mezzanine if i re if i remember correctly so in that question the answer was it was not a mezzanine level because it was 250 or 300 or something like that so they couldn't count it as mezzanine um and i think this was like a um for the certifier to count it as mezzanine or not mm. i hope that answers the question so yeah and also some sometimes the <laughs> sometimes the exam assumes you're working in a vacuum like you don't have um, consultants you can ask or you know you, you have don't have the internet <laughs> it's not always reflective of reality it's just a test of your basic knowledge um so don't don't so one thing i always say is like the exam is not reality it is not meant to be reflective of reality it is meant to be reflective of what either the law says or the code says or what a judge will judge a reasonably competent architect as. In in practice, everything happens. All of the answers can be correct. All, sorry, all of the answers can be done and have been done. Doesn't mean they're correct. That's why you get to ask it. If everyone was doing the right thing, they wouldn't be tested. <laughs> um, so, okay, Ella's question is even though the code of conduct for architects is state-based and they don't ask state-based questions in the exam, yes. Would you say that it's similar between the states and we should use that as our main guide for a reasonably competent architect? Okay, so the code of practice, code of conduct, whatever it's called in each state, is not the measure of a reasonably competent architect. The code of conduct is state-based for state architects and if you're practicing in that state, then you have to follow that state's code. It's just a set of rules that everyone needs to follow. If you breach it, the um, registration board can fine you. That's all it is. The test for a reasonably competent architect is not in the law. It is in the industry. It is by your peers. It is how everyone else practices and is expected to practice as an architect. 
So that's why we have the interview process because they're the ones that are testing well, basically interviewing you to see if you would be a reasonably competent architect if you got registered. If you get sued and there is a test of reasonably competent architect, they might invite like um, a peer review or like a, um, a uh, expert witness to review the situation to say, you know, in my judgment, I think a reasonably competent architect should have done this or this or this. So that's the test. Um, Ella Wood, are there any maths-based questions in the exams? I don't think so. They don't give you a calculator. Like, if there is, it's usually things like, I don't know, basic plus minus. I don't remember anything to do with maths. Stella? Um, not really maths. It's more, um, so I think numerically it would be NCC type of questions. So, you know, like, um, say, for instance, you need a balustrade if, if, if your floor is more than a metre, that sort of thing. I think those are the, the numerical, um, numerical things you need to remember. Nothing about calculating areas or things like that. Yeah. What about something like, you know, GST or you know percentages no. on progress um, things and no okay no they, they don't ask you to do all those type of calculations because in your exam well when i did the online one you're not allowed a calculator yeah. um you're only allowed a pen and a paper and now i remember that we did have about 30 minutes before the exam where you need to go into the waiting room the virtual waiting room and they check your room they um they do a scan of your room to see that there's nothing in it. Um, you've got to also like put your camera down to see what's in front of you and you're only allowed a piece of paper and um, a pen. So there won't be any complex calculations you'll need to do percentage wise or anything like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll take the last question and we'll just dive into the next session, uh, next part of the session. So. Do they ask questions in regards to work on international projects and practicing as a registered New South Wales architect? What would be a potential liability? Uh, short answer is no. They test you on practicing in Australia, um, not state based. It's just, you know, if you're an architect anywhere in Australia, you should know this. Um, Actually, there was a question that I had in the second exam. Hmm. Um, it was it was saying you were like a, you were engaged by the government to do some buildings in different states. So I think the question was like um, whether or not you need to be registered in each state um, to be able to do to do the designs in those states. So potentially there could be a question um, about doing work in different states. I didn't come across an international question, but maybe just prepare yourself for that. Yeah, yeah. just in case. Yeah. So the short answer, I, I work with a um, multi-state firm on government projects. You have to be registered in every state the project is potentially in. It's just required. Sorry, not you specifically. The um, nominated architect has to have a license. And um, in terms of the code of code of conduct, the code of conduct applies where the project is based, and you should technically have registered in that state. So therefore, that code applies to you. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, cool. Um, we have gone through all the questions. If there are any other questions, feel free to add it. But I'll move on to the next part. Um, we've only got half an hour left, so I might speed things up a little bit. Um, exam experiences. Um, we've touched on quite a few. Um, Stella, is there anything else you would like to add? Um, just just um, definitely think about the questions as questions. Um, you know, do the elimination method where you find the two most suitable answers and think about that. You are time, so um, if you are practicing, 
um, your the exams like um, question wise um, time it make sure you practice your time management because um, yeah if some of the uh, like the first questions one two three questions are relatively easier um, and then the last two or so are a bit more the, the scenarios I mean um, can be a bit more complex um, yeah, so think of it like an exam where you eliminate um, two answers first and then really consider the other two answers. Mm. I agree. I think the elimination method works for me because um, it just helps you focus your attention. So when I did it, um, I just read, I, I did, I read through everything three times. I think most people did it, read it twice. The first time I read it, I was speed reading. I just read the scenarios read all the questions on my sheet of paper. I just, for every question I wrote down, like the, the two the two answers I think it might be and just left out the ones that I think it definitely isn't. So then I had a short list of potential answers and then I go back and then I reread it again. And then I go through and say, okay, is it A or C or is it B or D or whatever it is? So you're just thinking of two potential answers or three, whatever, um, instead of, you know, four. Um, I think if you try to pay too much attention to each scenario and question, you risk running out of time. So I would at least try and read through everything once by like the halfway mark and make a couple of attempts at answering the questions that are obvious. And then the second half is like going through the ones that you haven't answered more carefully and then like, you know, pitching the best one and then the last, you know, five, 10 minutes, just choose an answer. Just choose anything. Like if you're down to two, if you're down to two choices, it's a 50-50 chance. You only need to get 60%. Just choose something. Um, so before I answered um, Barbara's question, um, has everyone, does everyone know about my YouTube channel? Has everyone read the APE part two mukbang video? Um, so if you haven't, you know, it's a video I made with my study buddy Fatima at the time. Um, it was, I think it was like a week after we took the exam. That is as fresh as it gets. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we just literally just talked for an hour about our thoughts, what we remembered, the topics that we were tested on, all the intricacies, like what we stumbled on all our strategies so if you read if you watch that i think it is a long video but if you just watch that over dinner while we're eating um in the video like you'll get all the tips that i had at the time that are most up to date um what else would you recommend going from start to finish um i would say yes stella what, what do you think um i th what do you mean like reading all the questions from start to finish or you mean like jumping from question to question okay. like scenario to scenario um i guess jumping if the harder ones are at the end and then the easy ones are the easy ones at the front or so when i say easy and harder i guess i i should rephrase it in terms of like um the questions at the front i noticed um, especially the second time around, it's more to do with the initial stages of of the whole um, the whole design construction process. So, like, so it'd be about design brief and and that sort of um, that sort of thing. So, I guess maybe I I wouldn't jump too much. Um, I would try and um, because each scenario is different. So if you've come to a, come up to a scenario where you're not really familiar with, maybe, yeah, maybe um, you can read, I would read it and then um, maybe move on to the to a next scenario. Because I think I did that um, for one scenario where uh, it was about schools and I've never done schools before. So I read the quest I read the scenario and read the questions and then um, I just left it and I jumped to the next one. 
but I wouldn't do it too much. I, I would maybe just jump one. Um, I'm sort of risk adverse, so I just didn't want to um, spend too much. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I was pacing myself um, well. But if there's like a one scenario where it kind of stumps you, I would, yeah, just move on. Um, if not, I would just go sequentially, yeah. Um, I would also go sequentially just purely for your own sanity. Like if you jump around too much in a stressful environment, you might miss things or you might say, oh my God, I'm on the last question. Um, I need still need to read the first and second or third. Like if you just go sequentially, it's just easier for your brain to process, you know, read the scenario, attempt the five questions, read the scenario, attempt the five questions. It's just a nice, get into a pace, get into a nice pace. Don't dwell too long on any one question. If you, you know, if you spend more than, you know, a minute or two minutes or three minutes on a, a question, move on, move on to the next one and then come back. Write it down on your piece of paper to come back and just keep moving. Um, what you wanna do is like, at least attempt everything once and then go back and check. Um, I would also suggest you frame the exam differently. I think a lot of people, they focus a lot on the scenarios. They focus a lot on, oh my God, this one's about schools. Or, oh my God, this one's, you know, about um, uh, a housing renovation. Oh my God, this one's about um, uh, industrial warehouse. I haven't done those projects before. It doesn't matter. They're just examples. What they're testing you on is like specific topics. So read the scenario, maybe read the first question and you'll know what they're trying to test you on. It's either liability, contract administration, subconsultants, employment law, um, whatever, you'll know very quickly what they're actually trying to test you on, regardless of what the specifics of the scenario is. At that point, just close your eyes for 10 seconds and just be like, okay, what do I remember from stock consultants? What do I remember from liability? Like what is important? What are, blah, blah. what didn't they do in the, um, what didn't happen in the scenario related to this topic? And then you go in. Is that at least now you're, you're narrowing your focus, you've, done a bit of revising in your head, just mental, you know, inside out, grabbing those ball memories and putting it into a pile. I'm like, okay, which one of these am I being tested on? So just a bit of, you know, mindfulness through the process will just help you calm down a bit. Um, what else can I tell you? Uh, breathe. It's better to just take a second if you feel overwhelmed during the exam like 10 seconds 15 seconds just stop look away and then dive back in then to just stare at the screen trying to work out what it means um your brain will process while you're doing other things you, you know you might move on look at read the next um question as you're doing that you're like oh, actually, I remember this. And then when you go back, you have a different interpretation. I remember I was un I was so stressed, like this where I read the scenario once, went back, read it again. I was like, I didn't, wait, is that the same thing? <laughs> um, what else? Uh, so I also don't think, okay, not all the information is in the, primary scenario, I'm going to call it primary scenario, the first chunk of text you read is usually not all the information. They add information as you go on. So when you go into a question, they'll add something and then that changes things. And then the next question, they'll change something else. And usually like it just goes on. So don't stress out if you read the first scenario and like this doesn't make sense because it's not supposed to. <laughs> um use your sheet of paper well it's there for a reason not to like um do math um it's just to jot down thoughts and notes or diagrams so you're like you know this you know this question is about sub consultants or question one um a is about this or you know they 
you know, didn't send, um, what is it? Didn't send certificate within 10 days. Whatever the key points are, you can use that to write down in your program and say, okay, this is what I'm basing these things on. Anything else, Sarah? Um, I, I use my piece of paper to write words, <laughs> to write words that I was hesitant about. Like, um, so, uh, so for instance, like those type of words. And um, yeah, so there was that, the question that Eddie was talking about with the awning, that one really stumped me because of the word, because the word was in this instance. So I just wrote it down just to put it down like visually um, and just re, like write it ha by hand just to understand what they mean by the word in this instance that sort of thing so depending on how you absorb information um yeah it the paper there is good to write things down that you want to remember or try and understand a bit more so for me i used it to try and understand or reinterpret what what they were trying to ask yeah in the first instance yes in the first instance <laughs> to the i day think that i remember that phrase <laughs> Yeah, the second the second exam was at the the one after the the next year. Mm. Yeah, there was another notorious word, but I kind of forgot that one. Um, yeah, mm. but they used it in um, the one scenario, and every single question had that word in it. And I was just like, oh my gosh, they did it again. So it'll be interesting to know if they do it this time around, like they keep using a word in a question. So that'll be interesting to know. Yeah. Send it to me, please, afterwards, if there's like another notorious term from this exam. I'd love to know. Um, so how, oh, a last thing before we answer more questions. Um, did everyone take a day off on Monday? Thumbs up if you did. Yeah, yeah, good job, fantastic, do it. If you haven't, email HR, whatever, 9 a.m. or or whatever just take the day off you will need it you won't be working on monday you'll just be stressing use it to study more or just take a warm bath or whatever <laughs> it's not going to help you on the exam day if you're tired and stressed out from work because you're worrying about work and then you're thinking about exam questions and those things get muddled and it doesn't it doesn't do well sorry it doesn't work well for you um so uh, how quickly do results get handed out? I think, oh, we were very, very upset about my session. I think it took like two, three weeks for the, the results to come out. And, but um, that's because there was that controversial question. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. So depending on how many controversial questions there are and how many they have to eliminate, you know, they, it could be a week, it could be two could be three, but usually within like two or three weeks, because otherwise people would just storm the AACA, the, the registration board office. Um, yeah, but if it is delayed, they, I, I remember they did send out an email saying it is delayed and expected when. Um, I'll also don't go back to work on the same day. You will just be drained. You get two, you get two days? How many days do you get? Oh, you get two days to, in the architect's award, one to take the exam and one to do the interview, but you know, use your annual leave, sick leave, whatever leave you have. Um, is there a strategy to read a question quickly? I wouldn't read the scenarios too quickly. Um, wording matters. So I would try, I wouldn't read slow and just like sound out every word, but I wouldn't skim either because you might miss something that's important. Um, and I also did find myself um, rereading the scenario after reading the question, because you'll, you'll then know what you're looking for and then the exact wording of the scenario. Stella, how fast do you read? Um, so the first exam, I know I didn't pace myself well, because in the, in the last, in the last, I think 10 minutes, I was just like, oh my gosh, I've got like five, four questions to do in different scenarios and I was like jumping quickly jumping from one to another so 
I think definitely practice reading. Um, yeah, not too fast because you will miss things if you read too fast um, and not too slowly as well because you will come, reach to a point where you're like, oh, no, I don't have enough time to answer the questions. Mm. Um, so I guess that's something you should try and practice these next few days. Um, the scenario questions were a bit long. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I think just just try and um, practice pacing yourself. Um, definitely try, you should be practicing pacing yourself with time. So if you've got that 90 minutes and it's five questions, I mean five scenarios with, is it four or five questions? Try and um, calculate how much you need on each scenario and um, reading the questions and try and pace yourself these few days in practice doing that, yeah. Yeah, and I would say don't just practice reading everything once and saying, okay, so 90 minutes, 10 minutes each scenario. You need time to review and revive, like going through it again. So take bear that in mind. Everyone, you know, attempts the exam differently and reads differently, absorbs um, information differently. So just decide what works best for you and just go with that. Um, yeah. All right, so we've got 15 minutes left. Um, I might dive into a couple of specific topics. You know, type into the chat, bot, um, chat box what you want me to start on first. And we'll just go with majority rules. So I've written down um, subconsultants, contract administration, liability, and building contracts. Which one do we want to start on first? First, first one to message gets the choice. Contracts. All right, we'll go with that. <laughs> cool. So um, I'm just going to use my own website, if you don't mind. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Oops. Uh, this one. No. All right, one second. I'm just sharing my screen. All right. Right. Can can everyone see my screen share? Oh, Google means you get to see it. There we go. Okay, so again, Architecture 101 website, um, Practice of Architecture in New South Wales course. This is a compilation of, whoops. Um, <laughs> this is a compilation of all of my um, study notes, you know, research. It's based mostly on acumen and also my um, experience um, practicing as an architect um, covers most topics. It is reformatted so that it makes a bit more sense than what's on Acumen to me. Um, but we are going to go into lesson eight, building contracts. So quickly, I think what people do stumble on a lot is the assignment of liability um, for different contracts. So I think everyone everyone should have a fair understanding of the different categories of contracts. So lump sum contract versus DNC contracts and um, cost plus contracts. It's pretty straightforward. Then it becomes, okay, if you have a project that is ABIC, who is responsible for what? That is assigned in the contract. Every type of contract assigns it in a different way. So if it's an ABIC contract, it's pretty equally distributed between you know, the client and the contractor. So the client is responsible for making sure to pay, um, making sure to give clear instructions. The contractor is making sure to build um, um, to the 
the contract documents, building on time, you know, um, making payment claims. So that's ABIC is very clear and it's designed to be clear. Um, D and C contracts. Who's who's worked on a D and C project before? Yeah. Yeah, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, not as many as I thought. Okay. So my last firm used to do almost exclusively um, DNC contracts. They actually advertised as like experts in DNC contracts. I'm like, that's it's not something to be proud of, but okay. So it's most used most often used by private developers because it puts almost all of the um, liability onto the builder. So the builder is then responsible not only for building the um, building the, the building, but also designing the parts of the contract doc documents that haven't been designed yet. So what usually happens in an ABIC contract is you have 100% documentation, you know, everything is detailed, everything is specified, you know, it's a stack of, excuse me, stack of documents sent to um, sent to the builder, they price it over tender, um, over a tender, and then they come back with a contract price saying, okay, we're gonna build it exactly to these specs um, that you've given us, and here's the price. Design construct contracts don't work like that. You design to a percentage, depending on what the client wants. So you, it can go from like 50% to like 90% documentation. Sometimes it's even based on like DA approval documents. It really doesn't matter because what happens is the builder then comes back. Uh, so it goes out to tender, the builder then comes back with a agreed lump sum price, just like we would give the client a price for our services. A builder then comes back and says, I think I can build this building at $2 million and I agree to stick to that price. So if I complete the design and it goes out to 2.5, that's on my that's my problem. If it comes back to 1.8, I get to keep the difference. So that's the distribution of liability and um, reward. Um, what then usually happens is the builder is also responsible for engaging all consultants. So you as the architect have a choice. You either walk away from the project if you don't want to work with the builder. So your your contract ends, your um, your so the builder then engages a new architect and they take over, or you novate yourself, which means your contract with the client moves to the builder, and now the builder is your client. The third option is the client engage, continues to engage you as their architect, the builder hires their own architect, and then you just you fight it out. <laughs> but depending on which role you're playing and which arrangement, your liability is different. So I'll, I'll go through it in each scenario. So the most common is you are novated to the builder, which means you are the builder's architect. They are your client. You, the client client, sorry, the owner is no longer your client. You have, you no longer have any um, contractual relationship with them moving forward. However, you still have liability for everything that happened before. So for example, if you designed something before you were novated and it was the wrong, it was not to the client's needs and they find out after it's constructed, you are liable to the client. Afterwards, if you design something that's not to the builder's request, you are liable to the builder. If the owner asks you to change something, and if the owner asks you to change something, A, you shouldn't be listening to them. You shouldn't even be talking to them. But if you do change it without the builder's approval, you are liable for not, well, you are liable for taking instru instructions from someone who's not your client. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think that the part that everyone struggles with is, um, oops, like they, it's hard, if you've never done a DNC contract, 
um, worked under a DNC contract, it's hard to comprehend that your client is no longer your client and you, the builder is now your client and how that relationship works. Because we're kind of trained to think our client, the owner is our client and they are God and the builder is our slave. <laughs> Shit, I'm putting this on YouTube. Sorry, we have a closer relationship with the owner than we should have with the builder. But when it's a DNC, it's flipped. It's the other way around and you actually need to perform your responsibilities to the builder. That's the first part I wanted to clear up. The second part is then um, what happens if there is an issue with your judgment? Sorry, if the, the arch sorry, if the builder doesn't agree with your judgment as an architect and they go off and do their own thing, who is liable? And I think I explained this before. Your job is to um, perform your responsibilities to the best of your, to the best, um, to the expected capabilities of a reasonably competent architect. You need to give the instructions. You need to keep the builder informed. It's up to them to make whatever decision they want to make. When your, when does your PI insurance kick in? Is when the builder gets sued for something that went wrong and then they blame it on you. So the, the owner doesn't sue you as an architect, they sue the builder and then the builder sues you. You are their sub-consultant, yeah? So the next one is um, cost plus contracts. So cost plus contracts, if you ever get that in question, what do they actually, what are they asking you to do? Um, in terms of liability and when is a good, they're usually asking you, okay, when is a good time to use cost plus contracts? Because there is a time and a place and a role for cost plus contracts. You need to know when that is and when that isn't. So usually it's like, okay, we have a home renovation extension. Um, I think that was actually a question. Like home renovation, um, there's a part of the house that no one's ever looked at. It's a hundred year old house. Uh, we need to knock it down or we need to keep it or whatever to build an extension um, with three bedrooms, whatever, doesn't matter. The question then is, okay, what type of contract should you use? So the answer is, well, usually to for the um, initial um, demolition and um, extension up to a certain point. Um, so demolition and re restoration, it should be, a, it could be a cost plus contract because the only time it's appropriate is when there's a lot of unknowns and it's impossible for the, the builder to estimate the costs, but it should end at the point where certainty can be, can be predicted. So, you need to understand, A, what are the different liabilities to you as an architect when using different types of contracts, and B, when to use certain contracts. Any questions on that? Nope. One more thing, if any of the attendees have reached the top level of AAC, remember that becoming an architect takes time, so eliminating unnecessary exams would probably be good for young architects. It is a waste of time when you have a firm ideally to involve a lawyer to do their job while you concentrate on design. Yes. Yes, that is true. Always have a lawyer on your retention. It's the reality of things. Everyone does. Everyone has a lawyer on call. If anything happens, you call them. However, why you need to know this is not so you know what to do when things go wrong. It's to know how to avoid things going wrong. Because there's only so much a lawyer can do at the point when the client makes a claim to you because you've already done it. The point of the exam and the registration process is to help you avoid it as much as possible. So yes, do A and do B. I know it's hard to get registered and hence why I did, I'm doing what I'm doing, but I don't think it's completely unnecessary. I do think it's harder than it needs to be. <laughs> um, but you know, again, don't work for the double, double ACA. They have their, they have their, they have their reasons. 
Um, anything else about contract uh, building contracts we want to talk about before I move on? Cool. Um, what do we got? Contract administration. All right. Contract administration. There's really one rule to contract administration. Read the contract. Read the contract. Reread the contract. Have a copy of the contract next to you. Executed, not just the template, because depending on what they write, things can change. And in the scenario, they'll tell you if anything is different to the template, if there's special conditions, you know, what what um, security type is, whatever. It's all should be in the scenario. What you need to understand, if I was telling you to revise, is claims, variations, the process to make a claim, variations to the work, what is how that works, the flow, what you need to do as a it, what you need to do as the um, administrator, what the client needs to do, what the contractor needs to do, what is the proper way things work. Um, I think there was one question about uh, uh, allowances for uh, bad weather and what happens, how you calculate that uh, when there's multiple occurrences. So like, I think, the, I can't remember exactly what it is. It might be in my YouTube video, but it was, um, you know, the project site, the, the contract had allowed for five days of rain. Um, they had used three. Then it rained for another five days. Um, but at the same time, the contractor had delayed the works by another six days. So then how many days of um, time and cost is the builder allowed to claim? So we, we I said there wouldn't be maths. That's a little bit of math. However, it's a multiple choice exam. There's four different answers. You can do some maths in your head, but really it's just to check which one's the most correct. And that's based on what the contract says in terms of um, uh, concurrent events. It's all in the contract. Um, and then finally, practical completion, completion of works, what do you need to do, when do you need, what do you need to issue, when do you need to issue things, you know, um, when do you need to attend site, you know, how do you, like, when do you need to issue your um, list of defects, what happens when it's still defective, how, it's, it, again, it's all in the contract, but you need to understand your role and what the process of things are never encountered anyone saying talking about dispute resolution uh, there's a lot about I think just evaluating you know claims um, nothing really on termination uh, oh differences between simple works and major works I've done a summary but again there's just a few things that are different and it's mostly to do with like the mechanisms inside so those are the things I would say to focus your revision on if you haven't already. Any, what about guaranteed maximum price when it would be a good time to choose this type of procurement? Okay, so guaranteed maximum price is basically a form of design and construct contract. So why it, it, what it means by guaranteed maximum price is the, the builders come back and said, yes, I can build this for you at no more than $3 million with the caveat that I get to change things. So it's it's like a, it's an old way to refer to design and con, um, construct contracts. So it's like, I guarantee that the building costs will not be higher, will not be over than X amount. And if it does, it's my liability. However, if it doesn't, I get to keep the difference. So you can do that with you can do that with a full documentation um, as well. So the, the difference between like a guaranteed maximum price contract in the truest sense and a DNC contract is usually guaranteed maximum price has full documentation. If there's anything that goes wrong, you know, the, the builder can't claim variations 
unless it's like a design change. So if it rains for, you know, three months or, you know, there's um, stock delays, well, stock delays anyway, um, the, the, the liability of time is passed on, time and cost is passed on to the builder. While in the ABIC contract, it's, it's distributed between um, the, the owner and the contractor. When would be a good time to choose this type of procurement? Uh, um, project management tri triangle, time, cost, and quality. When time is, sorry, cost is the most important thing, that's when it's most appropriate. Like they don't have an extra dollar to spend. Um, what would you be able to differentiate between attribution and dispute resolution? What do you mean by attribution? Sneha, what did you mean by attribution in contracts or any clarification in contracts? Uh, I can't remember what, what does attribution refer to? Um, Do you mean um, who's responsible? Is that what you mean? Oh, it's what, are we talking about? Oh no, who's re moral right attribution? Are we talking about moral right attribution? Sneha? Yeah. Okay, I think we'll talk arbitration okay so there's, <laughs> there's a few topics so I'll, I'll go through them quickly so dispute resolution basically happens when you've tried to make a judgment based on your understanding of the contract um and the owner and um contractor still disagree so that's when the dispute resolution clause activates so again you're not there to decide well, you're kind of there, but like you're not there to um, uh, make the final call. You're just there to provide a judgment, time, cost, and quality, um, and help them resolve any disputes. Doesn't mean there's no disputes. Doesn't mean that you know they don't argue. If they do, it's out of your hands, and you take it to tribunal or whatever is in the contract. So that's that's your job is to make the first call. And if they still disagree, then go into dispute resolution. Moral rights attribution, we haven't talked about. Oh, arbitration. Oh, okay. So, yep. So there's a process. So dispute resolution process, first attempt is just sit down. Oh, send a letter saying there's a dispute. Both parties sit down and try to talk. If it doesn't work, then you go to a, an authority, which is the arbitrator. Uh, so let's, you go to a mediator first, depending on where you've nominated. Um, and then you work with the mediator. So then, but then if the mediator doesn't work, then you go to court. So that's, that's the process in the ABIC contract. Again, they can, you know they can they can do whatever they want at that point <laughs> they can go straight to the lawyer if they think it's not going to work but that's the process outlined that all parties should at least attempt to follow doesn't mean they're going to resolve things they might sit down in five seconds and say you know i i'm not agreeing to anything i'm not budging and then you just move on cool um all right, any other questions about contract administration? Conflicts of interest, are we all clear on that? Thumbs up if you are clear. Thumbs up if you want to, yeah, if you're clear about it, yep, yep. Cool, I'll just touch on it and it comes up all the time. You need to remain impartial in every human, sorry, in every um, reasonable way. And again, it comes back to, you know, architects generally like to form a close relationship with their clients. They give us return work. We don't want to piss them off. Whatever your reason is, they're your mom. 
it doesn't matter. As soon as you sign on the dotted line to accept the role of contract administrator, you are impartial. You have to be. If you're not, you will get sued. So you need to make your best judgment regardless of the client's wishes. If they have a problem with your decision, they take it up through the contract. They're not technically allowed to sue you for contract um, breach of contract um, because you did nothing wrong. However, if they do threaten you, call your PI insurer. <laughs> it happens. Look, there is there is a, a, a point when legal theory breaks down, and that's when emotions get involved. Like, yes, there is a very clear way that everyone should behave. It doesn't mean that they do. So this this goes into like you know business management and practice management and how you manage clients or you know it's part of the reason why people don't even want to do contract administration these days it's too hard and it pisses everyone off but if you get a question like that about contract administrator's role there there are there is no gray area you have to be impartial um cool I'm going to do one more topic. Building contracts, some consultants. Do we still need to do liability or are we clear on that? Thumbs up if you want to talk about liability. Okay. Oh, we have one from Barbara, one from Dan. Okay. Any specific questions? I won't go into the whole thing. Any specific questions? Yeah. I guess uh, being novated or in the different types of contracts, managing the documentation and design of compliance when they are trying to change it. Um, but, and I, so I, I think like the answer is just always get everything in writing. Like, yeah. That's the thing you can do. So I didn't. I, I missed the first part because it was crackly. What was the first part? Uh, just so in in like D and C contracts and in um, scenarios where you aren't running the contract admin mm -hmm. and, and where the contractors and or the clients change the design and the and it makes it non-compliant. Okay. Yes and no. Um, your responsibility as an architect, this is just me talking from practice, um, is yes, partly to action your client's request. You should try and design the building that they want. If you do realize that some things are non-compliant, you need to raise it with the client. Don't action it. If they want to action it, tell them to find someone else to action it. You can't action it. If it comes to compliance, you, what you draw on the piece of paper has to be compliant regardless of what the client wants. Because as soon as you draw it and it's non-compliant, you can't blame it on the client. So yeah, it, it might be in writing, they've written to you, I want it this way, I know it's non-compliant, doesn't mean that you can draw it. Um, there is a really good way of thinking about this. Even though you're, you've been innovated in a design and construct um, contract, there's still the possibility that they want you as the architect to certify the design. So in that role of certifying the design, you need to still, um, as, you, as your duty of care, you still need to comply. Um, and you, yeah, you still need to comply with the standards, um, BCA, things like that. So maybe just remember it that way. Um, mm. Yeah, hopefully that will help. Mm. Think of it this way, don't, again, change your perspective. Imagine you're not an architect, imagine you're a structural engineer and the client comes back to you, I wanna build a cantilever that's 50 meters long with one column on one end. Do you draw it? You can draw it. Would you ever draw it that way? Like, you would just tell them no <laughs> because you don't want people to die. In, that's that's like the most brutal and direct scenario, but the, the the principle is the same. Like, yes, 
you need to educate the client. You tell them when things are non-compliant. But your job is to make sure it is compliant. And regardless of whether you have to certify it or not, you need to spend. You need to. You need to use your best judgment again. Reasonably competent architect to do things to the law. Everyone does. Um, what was the other thing? Now in New South Wales, we have a fun thing called the Design and Building Practitioners Act, which is now law that you have to draw to the NCC. And you have to certify it's drawn to the NCC for particular classes. But yeah, it is now law as opposed to um, uh, civil. Like it's not taught. It's not about negligence or reason. It's not about negligence um, or professional practice. It's literally like your legal responsibility to make sure it complies. Um, any other questions? Are there many questions about practice management and architects award in past exam experience? There was a question about employment law in my test, which I was surprised a lot of people failed. <laughs> um, it was just basic employment law. It's like, are they a contractor or are they an employee? Are they casual? Are they part-time? Like, what are your responsibilities? Like, things like that. I don't think, do you, have you encountered anything about practice management? Stella? Um, yeah, so that, that exam you're talking about, yeah, they did have that question. In the second exam, they did have another question as well. Um, they had a bit of a scenario about um, engaging employees and um, so it would be it would there's a high chance of it being another question mm -hmm. so definitely read up on it if it's not in the question scenarios it will definitely be in the interview they will definitely mm -hmm. ask you to run through what kind of um, what you need when you start your own firm or yeah they'll definitely ask you that yeah so that's one of the um missing missing um pieces of acumen that i was very upset about so in my course i have done a full lesson on business planning management practice management including employment law so you can go through that if you've signed up um cool so let's move into everyone's favorite topic to wrap up which is sub consultants so consultants. So I work um, at a um, architecture engineering firm where full service, we do all projects with sub consultants. I have actioned a lot of my knowledge. It's interesting, but there is a reason why they focus so much on sub consultants. Um, ultimately, there's no one else to blame. That's why they want you to hire sub-consultants. So in, in the case, especially with the government, in a case when something goes wrong, they don't have they don't have time or the resources or even want to work out who to blame. They just want to point one finger, who, which is you as the head consultant, because everything else is under you and you have the insurance. That's all it really boils down to. It's not about whether it's a good idea to engage sub consultants. It's almost never a good idea. <laughs> there are some benefits, but most of the time it's just not a great idea. The, t the test, the exam is really testing you. You know, if you're put into a position where you have to engage sub consultants like me, what can you do to reduce your risk of going bankrupt? Well, you, you'll still get sued no matter what. If things go wrong, you'll still get sued. It's not about avoiding getting sued. Partly it is. It's about how do you reduce the the, the damage when you do get sued. Um, so key, key concepts everyone should know. Client engages you as the architect or head consultant. That's what they usually call you. Engages you as a head consultant. Um, that's, that's the contract relationship. The client does not have any other contract relationship with anyone else until they engage a builder. You as the architect then engage all the other consultants as sub-consultants. So there's the contract relationship with every other consultant. So think of 
liability as like, you know, energy along this web, it can only travel along the lines. So you have um, contractual liability with the client, then you have contractual liability with the consultants. The client sues, if the client wants to sue, they can only sue you because there's only that line. Then from there, you can then sue the other consultants. That's that's all you really need to know. That's how the that's how the liability works. Just it's a web. The liability travels through the web. It doesn't go anywhere else. Um, second thing is um, process of events. I think that's that's what that whole like in the first instance um, question was about. It's like who gets sued or who's liable or whatever in the first instance. So in that web from the client, where does the liability land first? So if I think in that question, there was a project manager and then there was us, that was different. But if there's no project manager, you're the project manager, you're the head consultant, there's nobody else, the liability lands with you first. So if the structural engineer screwed up, you find out about it, you need to call your PI insurance immediately if they're your sub consultant, because you will be the first in the firing line. Once you get once you get um, once you get sued, and it is then determined that it is the structural engineer's fault. From that point only, you can then claim on the sub structural engineer. So you can't get a claim without it being determined. Then go to the like, and then immediately go to the structural engineer. I'm going to make a claim against you. So it only, everything happens after the fact. So client sues you, client is right, you then go to the structural engineer who then might say, no, because I don't have the insurance or I don't have, I've limited my liability or I don't, <laughs> you know, we don't even have a contract. That's the sequence of events. So what you're trying to do is predict the things that can go wrong, like um, clients claim might be you know 100 of the building budget so let, in this scenario let's say it's 10 million dollars right so the client is budget is 10 million dollars the maximum amount they could potentially claim against me is 10 million dollars the scenario i always use is like if the building blows up if the building <laughs> blows up and there's nothing left how much can i be sued for and you use that amount make sure you have enough insurance to claim that um, to cover that. So, you know, insurance on every claim should be at or over that amount. So it must be over 10 million. I think the thing that people get confused about is like, you know, they say they have $20 million in insurance, but it's 10 million per claim. So your coverage is 10 million, not 20. It's another topic for insurance. So from that 10 million, you get sued, you have to pay the 10 million. It, sorry, insurance pays the 10 million. Then you go back and you claim against the structural engineer, you need to make sure then they can pay the whole amount. Assume it's the whole amount if it's a structural engineer, they need to be able to claim the $10 million, uh, pay the $10 million. So when you engage them with that in mind, you have to go, okay, can they pay that amount? Do they have enough insurance? And in my contract with them, am I able to claim that amount or have they limited the liability to whatever? And then also, you know, if this happens, uh, you know, if the building blows up in 10 years, have I limited my liability, you know, to be five years or is it 10 years in a day? If it is 10 years in a day, okay. If the, if it's, say if it's 10 years and then I go back and claim against the structural engineer, is the limit of liability less than 10 years? Because if it happens at 10 years and they've limited it, I can't claim it back, I go bankrupt. That's the way that I try and understand all this stuff. You can read the content and say, you know, you need to have back-to-back -back contracts and you need to limit your liability and make sure the sub-consultant, you know, has also not limited their liability or whatever. It's a lot to remember. But if you understand the logic and the, the timing of events and how things work, it starts to make more sense. Is that helpful? Does do you have any other questions?
when releasing the progress certificate, you find a crack in the wall. Will the contractor or the structural engineer be liable? Depends on the crack. <laughs> if it's a crack in the plaster, or is it a crack from like the ceiling to the floor? Um, and then it's like cracked through the whole plasterboard and the stud work. It depends on the crack, but also not for you to immediately determine. Yeah. So you say you you you've inspected the works, you are about to release a progress certificate, and then you hear a crack. <laughs> um, I guess again, de devils in the details. Um, depends on what you're assessing. So if you are assessing whether the work has been completed and the work has been completed and you, you issue the certificate, the certifier can be liable too. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm saying like, if you're certifying, say you're certifying the bedroom and there's a crack in the kitchen. Um, if it's two separate things you're certifying, it doesn't matter. If you're certifying the kitchen and then you find a crack, then you don't certify until they rec rectify the works. Because it's not, it's technically incomplete or technically defective. Yeah. So you don't certify anything that's that's not to standard or broken. But is that what you were trying to ask or am I misinterpreting? Yeah. With, who's liable, who is actually liable for certain things generally can't be determined um, immediately. So, you know, every, I don't know, I'm assuming most people rent, you know, people say, oh, the, the ceiling is leaking. Um, it's the owner's fault. Might not be the owner's fault. It might be the unit above you. It might be the waterproofing. It might be the structure. It might be the roof, it might be the wall, it might be maintenance. It could be a million things. You can't tell what it is at on like on the spot. It's almost always impossible. So you need to go through a process um, to determine who is actually liable and who needs to rectify it. Fit for purpose. Oh, okay. How do I explain fit for purpose without? Oops. I keep doing this. There's recordings on every lesson, so I've just auto place. Um, fit for purpose is what it says. So, I what you are designing. So, are you talking fit for purpose? I, I'm going to do both, but fit, fit for purpose to the architect and fit for purpose to the to the builder is slightly different. So when it comes to fit for purpose as an architect, the question is, what your um, are you designing something that is what the client wants and actually functional to their client's needs and specifications? So if you're designing a house and the client has told you, you know, I want a three bedroom house and you give them two bedrooms, it's fit for purpose. If you design a um, house that's three bedrooms with no roof, not fit for purpose. If you design a house with three bedrooms and a roof that leaks, also not fit for purpose. Does that make sense? So there's multiple layers, but it's all like, I'm paying for something. Is this what I want? In the CA, it says there is no expressed or implied term. What? Dean, do you want to comment? I had actually the same question. It says in the CAA that we are not actually liable for making sure the building is fit for purpose. And I read it going, that can't possibly be true. Surely that's our main yeah. Like, <laughs> purpose is to design something to the brief. Well, but it does. It says it in black. It says, in A2, importantly, you do not give any express or implied warranty that the project or design is fit for the client's purposes. Yeah, okay. So uh, fine line as always, 
just like we don't certify that everything is designed to um, standard or, you know, we never certify that the building is compliant with all codes and standards because the codes and standards are so complicated, you can, you can try your best. You can try your best and make sure you tick all the boxes, but the builder might use the, like put the, install the um, waterproofing slightly wrong and it leaks. So you can't certify that it's, you know, you can certify that it's designed. You can't certify the building itself is compliant to all codes and practices. So in terms of like fit for purpose, you express or implied purpose or not, uh, whether there's like a, a term or not, um, your responsibility is to, to design to the it's just 101. And then whether you claim that it is fit for purpose, the CAA says no, because it's hard to, it's hard to deliver everything that the client wants. Um, and also, you know, it's, it's hard to um, make sure that everything goes right. So I think that's why it says just there, don't put an express term in, like there is no express or implied term because I, they don't want that liability on you, mm. even though you have that responsibility to do your best. I think like answering our own question sort of is that it, it specifically says express or implied warranty. Oh. So legally yeah. we don't warrant it as in, as opposed to, you know, we're going to do what we say we're going to do, but we don't provide a legal warranty that it is going to do that for what, for the reasons you just said, right? Yeah. The important mm. word there is warranty or guarantee. Mm. Um, so in the ABIC, we don't have any wording like that. Um, say if you've been engaged um, by a developer and they've created their own contract, just have to double check. They don't specify anything um, with any wording like guarantee or warranty in it, um, you shouldn't accept a contract like that because, yeah, we can't guarantee or, or warrant something something like that. It's really subjective as well, yes. Mm. Um, Nicholas's question on um, uh, liability after final certificate. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. So uh, liability after whatever. So depending on what's in your client and architect agreement, you can put in a limitation of liability. If you don't, then the statute of limitation applies. So from the point that they realize that something went wrong, I think it's six years. After six years, you're not liable. But it's from when the, the knowledge is realized. So when they find out that the waterproofing is broken, they have six years to fix it, or you're not, you're off the hook. Um, I think Victoria also like introduced a law saying like, you know, there's like negligence is limited limited to X amount of years after um, construction. Yeah, depends, depends on the state, depends on the laws, but without a clause, it's what the law says. If you do have a clause, then it's whatever the clause says. So if it says limited to five years post final certificate, or no, usually it says five years post the completion of contract. So if your contract ended at construction certificate, then the liability ends five years after that, not five years when the building is completed, except for negligence. As we all know, negligence is infinity plus one years. Um, so it's because of limit of liability, it's like when the event happens plus six years. So whenever that, whenever that happens, but that's, I think that's what the Victoria law is trying to, to stop is like, you know, someone's designed a building 20 years ago and now there's different standards or whatever, and it falls down on someone. I don't know. They just want to put a, put, put a full stop, a reasonable full stop on being able to claim against, um, someone's wrongdoing like, a long time ago. Um, yeah, what if the above occurs 12 years later? Again, doesn't matter. Depends what you agree to or what the law says. 
And they usually will tell you in the scenario, like, you know, you've limited your liability for two X years, whatever. They usually give you those kind of factors or parameters for you to make your judgment. Yeah. Cool. We are now officially at 1.30. <laughs> I think we'll call it a day. Um, just before we leave, um, I want to thank everyone for attending the session today. It's my first one, so I really hope to keep doing these. I think, um, yeah, before every session, I think I'll try and make time to do this. I hope everyone got the answers they were looking for today. If you have any more questions or something comes up over the next few days as you're um, studying, feel free to email me. Um, if you don't have my email already, I'm just going to type it in the chat. Info. Um, and then if you need more material or support to study, um, you know, I have the Architecture 101 website. Um, I've shown you the practice of architecture New South Wales course. Um, you know, usually I sell this for $199 for a 12 month subscription. Um, I will add a code to the chat which will give you 50% off. So it's $90, $99 until the end of June. So it's valid until you um, until the end of the interview period. So you can use it after you pass your exam to revise for the interview as well. So feel free to use that code if you want. Um, the practice exam is also on there as well. It's $50. Oh, the course also includes the practice exam, so you don't need to buy both. But if you just want the exam, it's $50. Um, I don't do this for money. It's obviously not a lot of money. I just use it to run the website. Um, but I mostly just do this because I thought the registration process was ridiculously hard and there wasn't any resources or help. Um, so I'm just going to share the knowledge the best way that I can. So if you enjoyed the session today, I have a short survey that I hope you could fill out for me. Um, yeah. Again, adding to the chat. And yeah, if you find everything, I, um, anything I do helpful and you want to continue supporting me, like the best thing you can do is just tell people about it. Other people you think might be taking the um, exam or preparing to take the exam and they need some help, just send them my way. All right, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Um, keep it up. You know, it's the last hurdle. Best of luck to the exam, and I'd love to hear about your results, um, good or bad, afterwards. And if I can keep supporting you in any way, just let me know. All right, take care. See you all later. Bye. Good luck, everyone. See ya.